Welcome to the session on Storage DRS. Storage DRS is a key feature for vSphere 5.0. In this session, we will talk about what is Storage DRS, what problems can it solve for you, how does it work, how easy it is to use, and then finally and most importantly, how you can take this and roll it out in your production environment, uh, uh, taking into account uh, considerations about interoperability with your existing products. My name is Manish Lohani, and I'm a product manager in vSphere product management team. And today, I will co-present this session with Ann Holler, uh, who is a senior staff engineer and a key architect behind this feature. Okay. This is just a disclaimer slide legal asked me to put in there. Um, the outline, we are going to talk about problem description. Then we'll look at a high-level overview of storage DRS features and concepts. And then I'll quickly show you a couple of workflows to demonstrate how easy it is to use. Very, very simple. And then I will hand off to Anne, who will give you some more insights about how storage DRS works, how the algorithm works internally uh, for both out-of-space avoidance and I.O. load balancing. Uh, we'll talk about some interoperability considerations, and then finally we'll conclude with some guidance on future work. Um, for logistics, uh, making it simple, we'll take questions at the end. Uh, we also have a few other members of the team, so we will have ample opportunity to answer questions even after the session. Okay, so let's look at what's the state of art today in storage resource management. VMware introduced DRS several years ago, and it worked it worked very well in many environments. But it, it also introduced some complications. If you couple your high-priority VMs with your low-priority VMs using shared storage, it was possible for low-priority VMs to hog bandwidth and starve your high-priority VMs of I.O. Well, we solved this problem using VMware storage I.O. control that was introduced in vSphere 4.1. So v, uh, storage I.O. control will fix this noisy neighbor problem by providing proportional shares of shared I.O. resources so that your higher priority VMs can get more access to storage I.O. So this is a very good start, very complex problem to solve. It took us many, many years to develop technology to deliver this. However, this is not the be all and end all. There are a lot many uh, storage resource management problems that you face on a day to day basis. Let's look at some of them through an example. Well, for folks who are interested in learning more about storage I.O. control, we added support for NFS in vSphere 5. So you check this session out, uh, VSP1933, if you're interested. OK, let's look at the problem. So here is an IT admin who has a fairly large infrastructure to manage. He has a lot of data stores. He has a really large server farm. And he gets a request for a new VM provisioning. He has to make decisions on which cluster do I pick, which host should I pick for my VM, and also which data store should I pick for my VMDK. Well, for server, um, the, the, his life is relatively simpler. He just needs to figure out which cluster he needs to place his VM, and then DRS will automatically pick the server for his VM. But on the storage side, things are not that way today. In this particular example, the three data stores are almost equally utilized in terms of both space and I.O. So for him, it's a very hard choice. What should he do? Should he pick the top one or the middle one or the bottom one? For as far as he can tell, they look identical. And he hasn't had any performance problem on any of them for the last 30 days or 60 days. So he takes a guess, picks the middle one, and puts the VMDK there. However, he was wrong. He had no idea of what the trends were for both space usage and I.O. usage on that specific data store. So after provisioning this VMDK, he goes home thinking everything is fine, and his job is done. Next morning, when the users start coming in, they start to see application performance problems, and they start calling in. And this is a very stressful event. Now he has to debug this problem live with users screaming on his head. So he says, OK, what can I do? I know it's got to be a storage problem, but let me just quickly take a look at CPU and see if CPU or memory is a problem. So he take, looks at stats and sees, nope, everything is fine. DRS is doing its job there. Starts looking at some network stats and sees, everything is fine here too. Well, he was just hoping to be lucky. But in this case, he wasn't. Now he has to decide how, do he, how does he fix this, this storage problem. 
One thing he can do is do a storage v motion to a different data store. But now he has to pick which VMDK should I offload of this data store so as to reduce the load. And then where should I place them? If he picks the wrong data store as a destination, instead of solving the problem, he could make it worse by making other applications suffer as well. In this example, he says, I put the last VMDK and it caused the problem, so that's the one I'm going to move. And I don't know which of these I should move, I'll just pick one. And he does that. In this case, he gets lucky. In this example, he solves the problem. But in real life, that may not always be the case. So the bottom line is there are three major problems that are demonstrated by the example. How do I choose where to place my VMDKs? How do I make sure that after the initial placement is done, subsequent changes in the environment may not lead me to out of space condition? And how do I make sure that subsequent change in IO load will not make the data store heavily loaded? Storage GRS solves these three problems, and I will show you how. So let's get into the, some of the high-level concepts of storage GRS. The new, there is a new object that is introduced in Virtual Center Server. It's called a data store cluster. A data store cluster is similar to a host cluster. Host cluster is to hosts, as data store cluster is to data stores. It consists of similar data stores. What I mean by sim similar is you cannot mix VMFS and NFS data stores into a cluster. You would not want to mix data stores with RAID 5 with RAID 10. You would not want to mix data stores with SSD and data stores with spinning disks. However, your data stores can be of different sizes. They can be uh, from different array vendors. They can be iSCSI or fiber channel. This data store cluster is an aggregation point for all the data stores that are members of this object. It's also a storage IO lo uh, load balancing domain for storage DRS. Let's look at a high-level architecture of storage DRS. It's very, very similar to DRS. DRS runs as a service under Virtual Center Server, and it has a bidirectional communication channel to individual hosts. It polls the host, collects their statistics for memory and CPU, and then combines them with the user setting for DRS that you specify to make decisions, and then sends those commands back to individual hosts. Actual vMotion is performed by those hosts when they get the command from DRS. Storage DRS works the same way. It runs as a service in vCenter server. It collects statistics related to space usage and IO usage from all the hosts that are connected to your member data store. And then using this information on an aggregate level and combining it with the configuration settings that you specify, it makes its recommendations and then sends those as commands to individual hosts, which in this case performs storage vMotion. Now you must be wonder wondering, uh, there used to be this object called host cluster, now there is a new cluster called data store cluster. How are they related? What's the relationship? And the answer to that is, the relationship can be looked at at two levels. At a host cluster to data store cluster level, the relationship can be many to many. A single host cluster can be connected to multiple data store clusters. Similarly, a single data store cluster can be connected to multiple host clusters. At the host and data store level, hosts, we strongly recommend that you fully connect all the hosts that belong to a cluster to all the data stores of a data store cluster. This gives storage DRS algorithms the maximum flexibility to make recommendations uh, when they are looking at the load and I.O. However, to take advantage of I.O. load balancing, it is required that you connect your host cluster fully to your data store cluster. Now let's take an um, example of the previous IT admin that I talked about and show you how, if he had storage DRS, he would not face the problem that he faced. So first of all, he was operating a fairly large environment with a lot of data stores. The first thing he could do is combine them into data store cluster so he doesn't have to manage them as independent objects and he could get a holistic view of capacity and uh, uh, all other capabilities of storage at a data store cluster level. Next, when he gets a request for VM provisioning, instead of having to decide which individual data stores should I place my VM or VMDK on, he can just point it in the VM provisioning flow to the data store cluster. 
and let storage DRS make a decision for him on where the VMDK should go. Once the initial placement is done, even if you make it very, very intelligent, there is still a chance that due to the dynamic conditions of your environment, space or I.O. load may make the data store um, overloaded. So storage DRS will continuously monitor the, that condition for your data stores that are a member of the cluster. And if it detects that the data store is overloaded, it will move VMDKs around using storage vMotion to reduce that condition and avoid that condition. Finally, DRS had business rules like VM affinity and anti affinity rules, which constrained VMs placement on individual servers. Storage DRS has similar rules. For example, if you have an application which has multiple disks, but all of those disks are required for application to work correctly, you would want Storage DRS to put all those disks together on the same data store to minimize your risk of unavailability so that if the, there is only a single point of failure in, in one sense. So that is, this is rule is referred to as intra-VMDK affinity rule. This is the default mode of operation for storage DRS. Storage DRS will migrate all your VMDKs together if a VM has multiple disks. If you have an application which has multiple instances uh, to provide redundancy, for example, a front-end server farm, you would want those applications to be ideally on totally independent infrastructure, both in terms of server as well as storage. Um, storage v uh, DRS has an uh, affinity rule called intra-VMDK anti-affinity rule. Uh, sorry, in this case, uh, Storage DRS has a rule called uh, VM to VM anti-affinity rule, using which Storage DRS will ensure that your VMs are always on different v uh, data stores. And finally, if you want to, uh, if you have a database VM, which has multiple disks, uh, but you want to keep them on separate data stores, for example, the, the data disk as well as the log disk, you can spe specify an intra-VMDK anti-affinity rule to ensure that they are always placed together. When you use these rules, they are used not only for initial placement, but also for subsequent migrations if storage DRS has to do anything. So for, in this example, these, uh, both of these are moved together. And then finally, uh, storage DRS offers this uh, feature called data store maintenance mode, where you can just put a data store into maintenance mode, and it, uh, storage DRS will evacuate it automatically for you, um, and place all the VMs and VMDKs that were on that data store on other member data stores while making sure that the load is still balanced. And then finally, if you are running out of capacity on your, so this is just a previous animation. If you're running out of capacity in your data store cluster, it is very, very simple to add a new data store to an existing data store cluster. You just add a new data store. And storage DRS will make sure that subsequent VM and VMDK placements will take that extra capacity into account. And also, during subsequent I.O. load balancing, it will make sure that the new data store that is available, that I.O. capacity is used. So you do not have to worry about moving VM or VMDKs manually. OK. Let's talk about uh, some of the UI workflows. And I will demonstrate to you how easy it is to use. It's very, very simple. So the first is create a data store cluster. It's very simple. Data store cluster is a child object of data center object. You just right click, new data store cluster. It will walk you through a wizard, a few screens, which will allow you to configure the settings on this. As you can see, there is an option to turn on, turn storage DRS off on a data store cluster. If you turn that, uh, st storage DRS off on a data store cluster, then it is just a folder of data stores. You can still get aggregated statistics, events, and alarms, but there will be no load balancing. This screen shows you that you can set automation level. The automation level by default is manual. So it gives you the maximum choice and flexibility in terms of deciding when is the right time to move, make those migration recommendations and do storage vMotions around. There is no, unlike DRS, there is no um, choice for initial placement. Because initial placement in storage DRS is always interactive and manual. It's not automatic. This is the main screen where you set all the knobs 
and controls that affect storage DRS algorithm behavior. As you can see at the top, there is an option to enable or disable IO metric for storage uh, recommendations. Storage DRS by default considers both space as well as IO for making its decision. But if you desire, you can uh, disable use of IO metrics. In that case, storage DRS will only use space-based metrics. The two red circles demonstrate the two critical thresholds that storage DRS uh, has. The first one is a utilized space. This is a global uh, control or threshold which applies to all the data stores within a data store cluster. By default, its value is 80%. What this means is that as long as your space utilization is less than 80%, storage DRS will not consider migrating any VMs off it. But once it goes above 80%, storage DRS may recommend moving VMs off it. Whether it will not or whether it will recommend moving VMs will depend on what is the level of imbalance in the, in the data store cluster. If all other data stores are also equally full, then a storage DRS may not see any value in recommending migrations. However, if a space and capacity is available on the remaining ones, then a storage DRS may recommend uh, migrations. Similarly, the IO latency is a global threshold for all data stores within the cluster, and the default value is 15 milliseconds. What this means is that as long as the average latency of a data store is less than 15 milliseconds, storage DRS will not uh, recommend any migrations of it. However, over a period of 24 hours, if for some time storage DRS sees that the latency experienced by the data store is more than this threshold, then it may or may not recommend migrations, again, depending on the amount of imbalance in the cluster. One thing to note here is that when you enable IO metrics for storage DRS, it enables SIOC, or storage IO control, by default on all the member data stores. Storage IO control and storage DRS are complementary technologies. Storage DRS works to avoid any congestion situation by proactively balancing the load for IO but storage IO control will manage the congestion in case it is totally unavoidable. In case you have workload and you run out of capacity, IO capacity, and there is congestion, storage IO control will ensure that your higher priority VMs are getting more band IO bandwidth than your low priority VMs. So these two are complementary technologies and used together. And then finally, you have to select um, what are the member data stores of the data store cluster. To do that, you first select which host and clusters, you want, and then it will filter the list of data stores that are connected to those hosts. You can also use other options like uh, connected to all hosts or partially connected, those kind of filter settings to see the options that are available for data stores. You can also use some other tags like system capability, et cetera, to filter this list, narrow down, narrow down this list further. Um, the second workflow I want to show you is uh, maintenance mode. So once you have a data store cluster, as in this example, prod cluster, um, you just right-click on the member data store and say enter SDRS maintenance mode. This will automatically migrate all the VMs and VMDKs of the data store. Um, now I will hand off to Anne, who will walk you through this create a virtual machine workflow, which is a perfect segue into giving you insights on how this algorithm works internally. Oh, guys, can you guys hear me? Now, can. now you can? <laughs> okay, cool. Um, thanks. Okay, uh, how about time for a poll break? And since this is Vegas, I'm going to bet on this poll. I bet a lot of people uh, do not enjoy the task of placing virtual disks on data stores. How many people do not enjoy that? Okay, some, some number. The rest of you either enjoy it or that's good, that's cool, or you probably have somebody else that does it for you. That would be my theory because it is quite tedious. You need to consider the quality of the data store that's appropriate for the virtual disk you want to place. And within that quality subset, you need to consider the space usage on those data stores, both currently and trending over time. You need to consider the I.O. load, both currently and over the last 24 hours, because maybe things aren't bad right now, but maybe during backup, things get kind of ugly. And finally, you need to consider kind of the business rules that you use in your organization with respect to how you place things. So these aspects of placement make um, creating a VM a big chore, and storage DRS is intended to relieve 
and reduce the amount of that shore. Storage DRS places VMs as part of the create VM workflow, so you don't have, any, have to do anything special there as long as you have data store clusters in your environment. It also places virtual disks for the clone workflow, for the relocate VM workflow, and for add a virtual disk to an existing VM workflow. So during that workflow, when you get to the point where you're supposed to specify the storage for a particular virtual disk, instead of just choosing a data store, you can choose a data store cluster. It's that simple. And with it, in this workflow, you can, and you see with the green arrow, you can specify, for example, the profile of, of storage that you would like, and if there's a data store cluster that meets that profile, in this case, the person want, wanted gold profile storage, uh, this person is then presented with the choice of a data store cluster that meets that profile. So choose that, move on. We get to the end of the workflow cre for create VM. And here we see the summary of um, the VM's um, attributes as it's created. And the green arrow is pointing at the data store within the data store cluster that Storage DRS thought was the best data store to place this virtual disk on. Now, this particular VM only had one virtual disk, but if it had multiple virtual disks, Storage DRS would have placed all of them, if it could. And you would have been able to, the person would have been able to specify even a different data store cluster for each virtual disk if they wanted to do that. For example, if they had different storage requirements for some of the disks for the virtual machine than others. At this point, the person can just say, good, I'm, I'm, I'm good with this recommendation, let's go with it. Or they can click the little box that's circled in red that says, show me all the recommendations Storage DRS had for placement, not just the top one. If you do that, you see all of the recommendations that Storage DRS thought were acceptable for placement of this virtual disk, not just the top one. So you know all of these recommendations meet the goals and constraints of Storage DRS. And you have the flexibility at this point to choose not the top one, but some other one, because you know something that Storage DRS doesn't. For example, in this case, the preferred data store, let's say Prod1, I know I'm going to take it down in a few days for maintenance. So I'd like to go ahead and take the second choice, Prod2, because I personally know that's a better choice. And so I have the flexibility to do that with this workflow. Now, one other thing that could happen is that none of your data stores currently have enough space to place the virtual disk without moving something around. If that happens, Storage DRS will make a prerequisite recommendation to move virtual disks in order to make room to place this new virtual disk. So that's it for creating a VM. But you may, may be thinking, well, wait a second. When Storage DRS places a virtual disk, how does that relate to server DRS choosing a host to power on the virtual machine that was placed? If you have a non-fully connected data store cluster to a server cluster, that is, not all of the hosts in your server cluster can see all of the data stores in your data store cluster, then there is an interaction. Otherwise, there's no interaction, and both algorithms can run freely. But if you have this non-fully connected situation, which, as Manish said, is not preferred, but which we support for um, non-IO low balancing, then the interaction is as follows. When Storage DRS chooses a data store to place the virtual disks for the VM onto, this restricts server DRS to only power that VM onto hosts that can see all of the data stores that belong to that virtual machine. And similarly, when server DRS powers on a VM on a host, this restricts storage DRS from being able to move the virtual disks associated with that VM to any data store that that host can't see. So in this non-fully connected world, what's the thing to do? It's best at provisioning time if the right choices of host and data store can be made together, because that's the highest leverage point to make sure that everything downstream is enabled. And so that's what happens. Storage DRS has an integrated host choice, data store choice option at placement time. So when you're provisioning a VM, and if you specify that you'd like that VM registered not on a specific host, but on any host in a, storage cl in a server cluster, and you have Storage DRS, DRS place your virtual disk, 
then Storage DRS will look at both the available space and I.O. load on the data stores in the data store cluster, which it normally does. But it will also look at the available CPU and memory with respect to each of the data stores to, to let that be part of the metrics that determine which data store to choose and which host to choose. And these four metrics, space, I.O. load, CPU, and memory are weighted with a higher weight given to whichever of the resources are, um, we're short of. Let's look at an example. Here we have a data store cluster with three data stores, and it's not fully connected to a server cluster with three hosts. And the user has requested that a VM be created, its VMDK be placed in the storage uh, cluster, and that it be registered on some host, an unspecified, in the server cluster. Here's a table that shows the situation. Each row is a data store, and we have four columns for the four resources being considered. And entries for a column of low mean that there's very little of that resource available, high means there's plenty of that resource available, and medium is in between. So if we were just going to choose, if Storage DRS was just going to choose a data store based on plenty of space and I.O., it would choose data store one because that's the best in that regard. But data store one is not connected to but one host in the server cluster, so the connected CPU availability and connected memory availability are low. So when we add in these two attributes, that's not the best choice. Moving on to data store two, it's a better choice with respect to available CPU and memory, but data store two has very little space left, so that um, resource is uh, low. So looking at the integrated metric, it's better than the data store one, but it's not the best. Now let's look at data store three. None of the four metrics are uh, low. Three of them are high, and it gets the overall integrated metric that's highest. And so that's the data store that's chosen. The VM is placed on that data store, and the VM is registered on host two because that's the host that has the most CPU and memory resources available and is connected to that data store. So that's it for placement. Now let's talk about rules. We'll go through a rule workflow. It's pretty straightforward, especially if you're used to server DRS rules. This is one of the three kinds of rules that Manish mentioned. This is the VM to VM anti-affinity rule. I don't want my two VMs to have any disk, not two. I, how many of you used server DRS back in the old days when you could only have two virtual, two VMs be in a VM to VM anti-affinity rule? Any old timers? Okay, sorry, we fixed that in server DRS, and we never put you, put you through that here, so you'll see that in a minute. Okay, you, this should be familiar to you people that use server DRS, so here's the drop down on the left that shows the different menu items for changing the configuration of a storage DRS cluster. And we see here that you can choose a VM to VM anti-affinity rule for your disks. You can choose any number of VMs to be anti-affine. Now, of course, if you choose more VMs to be anti-affine, then you have data stores in your data store cluster. Storage DRS won't be able to satisfy that rule, and you'll get a fault on the rule. But you have that flexibility of choosing as many as you like. And finally, at the time this rule was defined, there was a violation of the rule in the cluster. And here's a recommendation from Storage DRS to correct that violation. We see here that um, the correction, this is in manual mode, which is the default, the correction, and in fact, any recommendation you get from Storage DRS has information about the expected impact on space utilization on the source and target data stores, as well as the expected impact on latency. So this is something we took to heart. You guys gave us that feedback in server DRS. I want to understand more about the value of the recommendation, and so we did that here. So that's it for the workflows. Now let's talk about what storage DRS does in the background or when things in the data store cluster change with respect to avoiding out-of-space conditions and with respect to balancing load. And storage DRS, as Manish said, runs any time a data store and the data store cluster crosses the space threshold. Any time you change a configuration, like you add a data store to the cluster or you define a rule, 
um, or when you push that button that says run storage DRS in the upper right hand corner. Now I'm going to talk about out of space avoidance algorithms separately from the load balancing al algorithm just because it's easier to present that way. But the two algorithms work in tandem. What I mean by that is I.O. load balancing is not going to recommend an I.O. load balancing move and then put one of your data stores into a low space condition. So each of the algorithms look at, at the metrics of the other one and only if both metrics are okay is the move recommended. Let's talk about out of space avoidance first because if a virtual machine can't get the space it needs to run, it's game over for that virtual machine and it's a ugly day at the office for the V3 administrator. Storage DRS for the data stores which are above the space threshold, which is user configurable by default 80%, looks for moves to correct that problem. And it eliminates moves that it considers marginal. The definition of marginal is a uh, threshold that the user can set, the default value is 5%, between the difference of space utilization on the source and target data store. What this means is if you have a source data store that's 82% utilized, and a potential target data store that's 78% utilized, storage DRS by this um, metric will say, that's a marginal move and I'm not going to consider it further. For the non-marginal moves, storage DRS looks at both the current space utilization of the data stores in the data store cluster, and looks at the history of space utilization growth, and projects out by default 30 hours to decide uh, which data stores are attractive data stores to which to move a virtual disk to correct this space threshold being crossed. And in association with making a choice of what virtual disk to move, storage DRS looks at the vMotion cost, the storage vMotion costs of making that move, both in terms of the extra IOs if the, if the virtual machine is powered on and mirrored, ha mirrored IO has to happen during the storage vMotion, and whether the virtual disk is powered on or off, the how much in excess of the space we need does this virtual disk provide? So we want to move basically the minimum virtual disk that will correct the problem given the growth rates involved. Let's look at an example. Here we have at the bottom of the screen depicted three data stores in a data store cluster. And above each data store is a utilization depiction with time on the x-axis, now is at the zero point, and time is going forward. Utilization on the y-axis, where the green line is the capacity of the data store, so that would be 100% utilization. And the red line showing utilization currently and uh, projected out in the future according to the growth rates. And we see here the data store three is highly utilized, and in fact it's above the 80% threshold. Okay, what to do? So the sucker choice is the 50% utilized data store because it's the lowest currently utilized data store. But its growth rate is quite high, and at this current rate of growth, if we look out 30 hours, it's not such a hot, um, hot place to put the thing. Data store two is somewhat more utilized currently, but has a much lower growth rate. And so it is a better choice for placing um, the virtual disk when both current and future, um, to move the, a virtual disk when you consider both current and future use. So storage DRS chooses to move the disk from data store three to data store two, and the overall result is that things are much better than they were. I still think these folks should buy one more data store, but things are much better than they were here. We have at least uh, a few days until we have to do something else. This is it for space. Let's now talk about I.O. load balancing. And let's talk about it in the form of an example where we look at the fundamental concepts behind I.O. load balancing. Here we see a depiction of two data stores. One data store on the left and one data store on the right. These data stores are depicted in terms of performance curves where load is on the x-axis and for the top two depictions, latency is on the y-axis. And as you can see, and as you would expect, latency go is going up linearly with load. 
And the bottom two graphs, we see load with throughput. Throughput does not go up linearly with load. And at some point, when the device becomes saturated, it flattens out and even maybe drops off a little bit. And we see here that data store two is much more, much lesser loaded than data store one. So at this point, presented with this, the question that storage DRS load balancing would want to ask and answer is, what if a VM's load is moved from data store one to data store two? Well, duh. Data store one will have lower latency and data store two will have higher latency. Data store one will have lower throughput and data store two will have higher throughput. That seems obvious, but there's something particularly subtle in this particular case. So let's look at it. In this case, because data store one was a steeper curve versus data store two in terms of latency, that is, as workload goes up on data store two, latency doesn't go up as quickly. It's a more powerful data store. Moving that load from data store one to data store two actually reduced the overall average latency, as well as reducing the maximum latency, which is certainly something we want to do. And data store two is in a sweeter part of the throughput curve than data store one. Data store two is still in the climbing part instead of the more flat part. So we actually got a little throughput boost as well. So the algorithm works on latency and tries to control latency above a certain threshold, but it also operates in a, in a part of the throughput curve by keeping the latency low that improves performance. So in this case, average latency was lower and overall throughput was actually better. Okay, this is what storage DRS does. But unlike us, storage DRS doesn't have these curves and storage DRS doesn't know the behavior of the VM decays up front in terms of their workload. Storage DRS builds a model of the data stores online, and storage DRS collects data on the VM decays over time to be able to do what we just did. Uh, well, let's talk about that briefly. So storage DRS creates a model of every data store in the data store cluster by presenting workload, that is outstanding IOs, and collecting latency numbers and creating a linear fit to those values. And the slope and intercept of that line is a description of that data store with respect to latency over, uh, as load changes. Similarly, storage DRS watches the workloads running in the virtual machines, VMDKs, over time. And it watches them for a non-trivial amount of time, by default at least 16 hours, to build a model of what all of the virtual disks that are running in the data store cluster are doing. And based on the data store um, models and based on the information about what the VMDK workloads are, Storage DRS can do what we just did. And in addition to that, Storage DRS has a cost-benefit analysis, which you guys may be familiar with cost-benefit in server DRS, that looks at migration time, that looks at the impact at outstanding IOs, latency changes, um, in order to make sure that the move is really good and also looks at the stable time of the workloads. This is kind of a simplified explanation. There's, um, these references on this slide have a much more detailed um, explanation and many more experiments uh, uh, presented than I can present here, but I will present one experiment here uh, on the algorithm. Here is three data stores in a data store cluster. The average latency um, is uh, almost 17 milliseconds in this data store cluster. And the data store cluster is getting a certain throughput of about 4,200 IOPS. Now, Storage DRS builds a model of the three um, data stores in this data store cluster. And the data store on the left-hand side has the flattest latency curve. And it's the data store that's under the latency threshold. The other two data stores are above the latency threshold, and Storage DRS has a latency curve um, created for them as well. Storage DRS determines from this information that the right thing to do is to move two of the disks from the far right-hand data store and one of the disks from the middle data store to that first data store because that first data store can handle the additional load without going over the latency threshold. It knows that slope of that line and how these workloads will affect that. And brings the late, average latency down below the 15 millisecond um, uh, limit as well as the per uh, data store latency below that limit. 
and improves the IOPS to almost 5,700 um, for the reasons we just discussed where we're in a sweeter part of the throughput curve. So this is the algorithm. We've talked a lot here about latency and throughput. And you may be thinking, hey, you guys don't give me very good charting on latency and throughput. How can I troubleshoot or understand the value of this feature? Hey, good question. We had the same problem. We've improved the charting for latency and throughput in this release. It's hard to see here, but um, on the left-hand side, you see um, the uh, la latency um, per data store. And below that, the latency per VM for the top 10 VMs by default. And over here on the right, you see the aggregate IOPS per data store, so that's your throughput. So we hope and believe these charts, we found them very useful as we've been running experiments, and we've run thousands of experiments in-house with storage DRS on a variety of data stores. We found these charts very um, useful in understanding what's happening on the data store and what value storage DRS is bringing. So that's it for IO load balancing. Let's finish off with the interoperability um, constraints around using this feature, and then, uh, and then summarize and take any questions you may have. So for interoperability, I have three slides. Each slide will list um, a product or a feature you may use in your environment. And then there'll be two columns for each of those rows that list that product or feature. One column will be whether we support uh, storage DRS with respect to placement of a virtual disk on a data store in a data store cluster and that feature together. And the other column will, whether, will be whether we support migration of virtual disks for space reasons or I.O. reasons in association with that feature. On this slide, we see that storage DRS is fully compatible with VMware snapshots, SRM, RDM pointer files, and NFS. It does not work with free vSphere 5.0 hosts. And it, in the current release, does not work with linked clones. Let's now look at how storage DRS interacts with various array features you may have in your environment. If you are using and have available array-based replication, storage DRS is supported with respect to um, initial placement. But for migration, we recommend keeping storage DRS in, ma in manual mode. Of course, it's in manual mode by default. Um, so that you can make a conscious decision about accepting a recommendation, and you'll see a description of what we think the recommendation will buy you, in the light of a temporary lapse in protection and the, the size of the next replication transfer. So you'd be able to see the value and accept, accept the recommendation when appropriate. Similarly, for array-based snapshots or array-based dedupe, we support them for placement. But for migration, we recommend keeping the migration in manual mode so that you can assess whether to accept the migration recommendation in light of the potential impact on space usage. And finally, for array-based thin permissioning, it's supported for placement. Um, but for migration, it's only supported on VAS-enabled arrays. This is VMware APIs for storage awareness. VAS-enabled arrays report an alarm if the backing store of a thin provision data store is running low. Now let's move on to talk about arrays that have various kinds of load balancing capabilities built into them. If you have arrays with auto tiering, if you have arrays that do load balancing, we recommend that you actually turn off the I.O. load balancing part of storage DRS. And Manish showed you how to do that in the setup screen. These arrays are handling the load balancing. We don't want two brains trying to handle it. And you still get the value and the complementary value of space placement and out of space avoidance, of data store maintenance mode, and of the various three kinds of affinity and anti-affinity rules. So this is, um, this is the interoperability information. Uh, let's move on to summarize. In summary, um, storage DRS provides easier storage management. It supports business rules. It 
uh, enables initial placement easily, avoids out of space, balances load, and supports data store maintenance mode. In situations where you have smart arrays, storage DRS still brings significant value. Uh, we've spent many um, person years on this feature, and we're excited for you to use it for peace of mind and for OPEX savings. And we'd like to solicit some feedback on how, speaking of working on it for years, how we can continue to work it on it for more years. A little job security here. So here are some features that we're considering. Please give us feedback on these features on your forms or you know, talk to Manish and I or uh, my boss, Bala, who's sitting right here, uh, if, you, if you want or need these features. One of the features we're considering is um, storage space quotas, because maybe you want to make sure things don't uh, grow beyond uh, what you would like to control for particular users or situations. Another feature we're considering is I.O. reservations. Maybe you would like to guarantee a certain throughput for certain of the virtual disks in a virtualized environment. We're considering resource pools for space and I.O. Those of you who use server DRS know about the advantages of resource pools for delegated management and for allowing resource controls at the resource pool level rather than on the individual VM. So we'd be interested to know whether you would like to have that kind of model with storage DRS. And finally, we've tuned storage DRS in a way that we think makes sense in terms of you know, uh, consolidation versus non-consolidation, but maybe this is not properly tuned for every environment. So we'd be interested in whether you want more knobs to, to specify how you'd like things laid out. So they say what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. That probably applies to the VMware party tomorrow night, but should not apply to storage DRS. Please try it here in Vegas in the hands-on lab, and please use it when you get back. Uh, thanks for coming to the session and missing part of your lunch. Uh, if there's any questions, come up to the microphone or catch Manish and I. Um, Whichever you prefer. Okay.